Hi folks, today we're going to do a little refresher on some of the chapter 7 material that may have fallen out of our brains over the last couple of weeks, because the test is going to be on both chapters 7 and 8. So graphing exponentials, exponent rules, etc. Now before we get into that, I know that there are probably going to be some people watching who feel like, I've got a pretty good handle on this stuff, I want something else to do. So let me just make a little quick plug here for the CEMC. So I've just Googled CEMC here. Uh, it's the Waterloo uh, Center for Education in Mathematics and Computing. And there are a few things that you might notice here. There's old contests. There's problems of the week. So sometimes I'll bring those into class, but you can access them all here if you're looking for something interesting to do. And there should be a new problem of the week coming out every Thursday. You can also subscribe to have them sent to your email address if you're interested in getting those every week. The other thing CEMC has is free open courseware. And it's, it's really great stuff. Um, so there's an advanced functions and pre-calculus course. There's a calculus and vectors course. It's all free. It's partially funded by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And yeah, just, just fantastic stuff. All right, back to the matter at hand. Chapter 7, Exponents Refresher. So we might want to remember some of our exponent rules. A to the 1 is just A. Anything to the power of 0 is just 1. And this is all assuming that A is a positive number. A to the negative m. Negative exponents mean that we flip. A to the m over n. Fractional exponents mean that we take roots. So this would be the nth root of A all to the power of m. So as a little warm-up, you might want to pause and then just try these few just to make sure that you've got a clear idea of how exponent rules work. And we're back. 7 to the 0, that's just 1. A negative exponent causes us to flip, so this is 1 over 3 squared, or 1 over 9. Yeah. Um, we've got 4 to the power of a half, so that is going to be a root. It's a square root, since it's just got a 2 over here. Okay, and it's all to the power of 1. So square root of 4 is going to be 2. This, on the other hand, tells us to take a square root, because of this 2, and then cube it. Now you can actually do that in either order, uh, but it's easier to take the root first. So square root of 4 is 2. 2 cubed is 8. So 4 to the 3 over 2 gives us 8. In the last few, the first part is telling us to flip. So a half flipped just becomes 2. And then we go 2 cubed. Ah, that's 8. 2 to the negative 3, again, it's telling us to flip and then cube. Think of this as the flip part, and this is the cube part. Cube part. So I get 1 over 8. Uh, the last couple have a little more going on. So this is telling us to take a cube root and then square it. Okay, the cube root of 64 is 4. Squared is 16. And lastly, we've got this one, 64 to the negative 3 over 2. So that's telling us you flip it, you square root this one, and you cube it. Let me get in a little tighter there. So square root of 64 is 8. And that needs to be cubed. Okay, and 8 cubed, at this point, maybe you need to go to your calculator, but that's 512. So 1 over 512 in the end for 64 to the negative 3 over 2. All that stuff comes up in logarithms as well. Um, so we do need to know our exponent rules pretty well. The next common thing that kind of falls out of our brains is how to graph a transformed exponential function. So we've been doing logarithms for a while. Um, we've typically been using a mapping method. We've been moving our asymptote, but logarithms have a vertical asymptote, whereas exponentials have a horizontal asymptote. So that asymptote is going to be a horizontal one. And what controls that horizontal is this final number here, the lift up or down. So I know from this one that for 3 to the x minus 2, the asymptote's going to be down here at negative 2. 
The whole exponential function is sort of bouncing off that, though it's not quite touching. The next thing we'll do is find two points with a table of values. So the TOV means table of values. We're just going to choose some convenient points. So I typically aim for exponents of 0 and 1. You can do whatever you want. In this case, there's nothing happening horizontally to this function, so I can just put in an x value of 0 and an x value of 1. Let's see what happens. If I put in 0, I'd get 3 to the 0 minus 2. Now remember, 3 to the 0 is just 1, so that's 1 minus 2. Ah, gives us a y value of negative 1. Now I'm ready to plot that point. So maybe I'll do this graph in red. There's one of the points on here. I'm going to do the same thing with uh, the other x value of 1. So if I put in 1, I'd get 3 to the 1 minus 2, which is 3 minus 2, or just a y value of 1. Now I've got a second point. So I've got this point of 1, 1. I've got this point back here of 0, negative 1. And all I'm going to do is connect them together in an asymptotic banana shape. And that asymptote has to be this horizontal asymptote, uh, asymptote on the bottom here. Let's try another one that's a little more involved. So in this one, we've got a bunch of stuff happening in the exponent. I know it's formatted kind of weird, but this whole thing is the exponent. Okay, the most important feature of this function is the plus 5. That's telling us what's happening to the asymptote. The asymptote is up 5. So let me graph that in here. Up 5. Uh, maybe I'll use a ruler this time. Okay. And I'm going to make my asymptote. So there's my asymptote to graph around. Now I just need to choose some convenient x and y values. Now notice here, if I choose 0 for x, I'm going to have negative 2 to the 3 over 2. Oh my gosh, that's unpleasant, right? That's a not fun exponent to be using. So instead, maybe I'll choose a different x value. If I chose the x value of negative 3, let's see what would happen. I'd have negative 3 plus 3 over 2 in the exponent. In other words, that would make my exponent a 0. Is it required that I choose this x value? No. Any two points are going to be fine. I just want to make my life as easy as possible. So negative 2 to the 0. So 2 to the 0 is just 1. So we have negative 1 plus 5. And we have this point, negative 3, 4. 2, 3. Maybe I'll graph the actual function in blue. Okay, the point negative 3, 4 is on it. Uh, if I put in negative 2, it's not going to be that convenient. But if I put in negative 1, let's see, if I had negative 1 here, negative 1 plus 3 is 2 divided by 2. Ah, that gives me an exponent of 1. And probably any integer exponent is going to be fine. Any whole number exponent is going to be com convenient. But exponents of 0 and 1 are probably going to be the easiest thing to play with in most cases. Okay, so that gives me uh, this point of negative 1, 3. All right, let's plot that on here, negative 1, 3. Maybe I'll zoom in on this graph now that I've got those two points. All I have to do is connect them up like an asymptotic banana. Okay, so it's never going to cross that asymptote. If I wanted to talk about the domain and range of this function, the domain's all real numbers because that's the case for all exponential graphs. Um, the asymptote is a horizontal line, so it's the horizontal line y equals 5. And just by looking at this, the range is y is less than 5. The y values will always be less than 5 because they're never going to cross that asymptote. So now, hopefully, we've revived some of our knowledge of exponential functions. We might be saying, okay, I remember that, but like, 
what's the difference between an exponential function and a log function? And often on a test, I'll see them get mixed up uh, when people graph them. So let's graph a basic one. Let's assume that the C value or the base is greater than 1, just so that we can have kind of comparable graphs. But your exponential function is going to look like this. And it's going to have a point of 1, 0, because anything to the power of 0 is just 1. And you'll also have a point of 1c. You don't actually have to memorize a whole lot for the uh, exponential graph. For the logarithmic graph, let's do this in a different color. It's going to also be an asymptotic banana, but in this case, it's going to have a vertical asymptote. So it's going to contain the point 1, 0. Somewhere out here, it'll have the point C1. Those two points really show us that these are inverses of each other. And there's our basic shape. So if we were in class, uh, I'd you know, use the analogy that one's a banana phone, one's a banana gun. Um, but I think if we just want to talk about their actual features, here's the biggie. The exponential graph, so that obviously that would be this one here, right, that has c to the x, exponential. It has a horizontal asymptote. By contrast, the, um, the logarithmic one, which has the big log in it over here, has a vertical asymptote. Asymptote. If we keep those two things straight, um, then you're going to have the basic shape. Now let's talk about a few other features. So the domain of an exponential is going to be all real numbers. If you have a positive base, you can raise it to any power you want. The range on a basic exponential is going to be restricted. Okay, because you can't turn a number negative by using a power if the base is positive to begin with. You can just see that from the graph. Y is never going to be negative. On the other hand, on the log graph, uh, we have a domain that is restricted. And the reason it's restricted is because you can't take the log of a negative or zero. You have a range, however, that goes on forever. Okay, so the range is all real numbers. And again, you can see how these are inverses. x and y just switched functions between these two graphs. Um, lastly, how do we graph them? I'm making suggestions on how to graph them. Of course, you can graph them however you want. But the way we've been doing it in class is this. Graph using asymptote and table of values. That's one of the reasons that maybe these ones were easier to graph. For the other one, we're going to graph it, or we have been graphing it, this way, using asymptote and mapping. And we've been mapping the points that are shown up here, the 1, 0, and C1, where C is the base. And again, you can use a different technique if you want. Um, when I give these domains and ranges, that's for untransformed functions. As soon as you start to shift them or reflect them, then of, of course their domains and ranges might change. Um, but it is worth noting, for every exponential, domain's going to be all real numbers. Um, and for every logarithmic, the range is going to be all real numbers. Okay, the last technique that I think we might need a little refresher on is solving exponential equations without a calculator. I mean, we could do this one with logs, uh, but it's honestly pretty miserable because it has x's on both sides. So because we have bases of 3 and 9, we can convert to a common base. We could use, in this case, a common base of 3. 
Now I'm not going to change the value of any of these numbers. 3 is still going to be a 3. I have 3 to the 2x minus 1. It's just that I'm going to rewrite the number 9 as 3 squared. The next thing I'm going to do is try and get rid of some brackets. So on the left, I still have 3 to the 2x minus 1. On the right, I have 3 to the, we have to multiply these powers out. So 6x plus 4. Now that we've gotten it written nicely with a common base, we can drop the base. And when we do that, we'll get 2x minus 1 equals 6x plus 4. If you're feeling fancy, you could put a therefore in here because we're reasoning it out, but it really doesn't matter. Okay, uh, let's keep on going. We will uh, move things over, so we'll have a negative 4x on this side, and we'll have a positive 5 over here, or x equals negative 5 over 4. If you have a calculator, you can throw it back in and check. You can also check this analytically, though it's, it's kind of hard to uh, decipher what exactly it means if you can't go to decimals because the answer is a fractional, uh, fractional it's going to give you fractional exponents. There is no checking required, though, in exponential equations. There's no situation where you're going to run into an extraneous root because you've done something weird. And that's because exponentials don't have domain restrictions. All right, one more. We're going to do the same sort of idea here. We're going to assume that we have no calculator. We've got to find a common base. So I've got a 4 and a 1 8 here. And of course, you could pause the video and try this yourself. It's probably a good plan. Common base of, pause it before I tell you. All right, common base of 2. Now, you could find more tricky common bases to work with, but I think this is the simplest way to do it. So for that 4, I'm not going to change its value. I'm just going to write 4 as 2 squared. For the 1 eighth, again, I'm not going to change its value. I'm just going to write it as 2 to the power of something. 1 eighth is 2 flipped and cubed. So 1 eighth is 2 to the negative 3, all to the x plus 2. At this point, I'm going to multiply out my powers. And often I'll see mistakes here where people remember to multiply this one and then forget to multiply by negative 1. So don't let that be you. All right, same thing on the other ones. 2 to the negative 3x minus 6. Okay, now things are looking pretty good. We can drop our bases because they are common. And we're just making the little logical step that if both sides are the same and both bases are the same, then that must mean both exponents are the same. So I have 4x minus 2 equals negative 3x minus 6. Just move some stuff around. 7x on this side by adding 3x. Add 2 to the other side. So we get 7x equals negative 4, or x equals negative 4 sevenths. And I guess before we completely call it a day, it might be worth uh, letting you know that you can check all your equations graphically. We've done this a little bit in class, but if I want to solve this equation with no effort at all, I can just go to Desmos and graph both functions. All right, so I've put both functions in. Uh, there, I've put them in separately. I'm going to graph one and graph the other. And you can see they have a point of intersection. It's at negative 0.571, and that is the decimal approximation of negative 4 sevenths. No work required. So if you ever just need an answer, and you don't really care about the method, you can always use this technique. Graph both sides of the equation, see where they meet. Now on a question like this, I would be looking for a method, and if it was no calculator, then I'd be looking for a method probably other than logs, the method that's shown here. All right, so in terms of some practice around this, you can do the Chapter 7 and 8 Mixed Review questions. They're in the video description below, and there's also full work solutions there on that PDF. 
Um, if you feel like you have a really good grasp on this stuff, you could alternately go and check out the problems of the week or some of the CEMC courseware. Tomorrow we'll do a little investigation into polynomials, um, but we are looking at a test on chapter 7 and 8 next Tuesday. Good luck with the material and take care folks.